Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. I, our webinar is going to start. Uh, we will just wait one minute more for more people to be able to join us. Thank you. Hello, good morning everyone and welcome to this webinar on advanced circuit breakers testing um, with the TM6000 solution. Uh, this is the second part of our circuit breaker seminar. I'm Mary, marketing manager for Mayor um, for Africa, and I'm very happy to welcome you today as the moderator of this presentation. I will be supporting you on technical issues and questions for our presenters. I have the pleasure to introduce you to us, Product Manager for SearchTech, our distributor partner. Thank you very much, Stuart, for being here. And please, a few words about SearchTech, your services, and our collaboration. Hey, Claude, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. A uh, little bit of background on Search Tech. We've been around since 1971. Uh, the company is basically split into two halves. There's the low voltage lightning and surge protection. And then we have the medium high voltage section where we look after the mega product range. We offer uh, obviously surge protection, hence the name of the company. We do a range of arc flash PPE, earthing systems, safety systems. We're an SEBS uh, product uh, approved business. And uh, that sort of puts us into a nutshell. So let me hand you back to Marie Claude and please enjoy the webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you very much, Stuart, for this presentation and all the great job you are doing with Mega Solutions. So, on the right side of your screen, you should see a control panel which is similar to this one. Um, this, this panel will allow you to submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing it in the box highlighted in red. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session, before the demonstration, and also we will be uh, doing another Q&A session at the very end of the, of the webinar. If we do not get the time to go through all the questions, they will be answered directly by email. And as well, at the end of the session, you will receive a survey where you will be able to raise questions and give us precious feedback. Last thing is that this meeting is going to be recorded, so you will have the opportunity to receive a copy of this webinar. Now, present you um, Bull Egbert with our application engineer. Um, please have a nice webinar with her. Bull, I give you the hands.
Hi, uh, my name is Paul Ekberg and uh, I'm the application engineer. And uh, from Mega Factory in Sweden. And um, I'm working also with um, support and trainings, and I'm also doing this type of webinars. Marie Claude, I think you need to share, give the, the control over to me somehow. Yes, there we are. Hi, yeah, so Bull Ekberg, application engineer at Mega Factory in Sweden. And as I said, I also do this kind of webinars, I do trainings and asking normal technical support questions. Um, I've been working here for more than 20 years. And before that, I used to work with ABB and I also worked a short while for Bombardier. And um, today we're going to, uh, I'm going to present uh, my um, PPT, if I manage to share my screen here properly. Uh, and it's about advanced circuit breaker testing. Right? So we're gonna, we, Tuesday, we were talking more about like the basics test and we are actually covering a little bit of that today as well. But now we're walking over to the part where we have in like the outdoor breakers, the GIS. So a little bit more complicated and bigger objects. So I hope you will be following me here. Uh, so we're gonna talk also hear about different types, just like we did on Tuesday, but now we're going to focus a little bit more on these outdoor breakers. And a small small details about parts as well. Uh, there are a little bit different um, possibilities and solutions with higher voltages. And we're going to look at the basic test for outdoor breakers and GIS and special test situations. And as uh, Mary mentioned, we're going to have a question and answers session after the webinar presentation and then we're going to have a demo with team 1700 where we're going to measure on a low voltage a medium voltage breaker because it's um it's actually eight degrees here now so it's not the time to go outside to do measurements and we still can use the big analyzers also on the medium voltage circuit breakers after the demo we're also going to have a questions and answers session and I hope you will be joining me here now, maybe like one and a half hour or something, which is going to have this presentation. Um, this picture I showed you last time, but it's going to be, I show you today as well. It's a medium voltage circuit breaker where we need a bigger analyzer because we don't have access to the main parts here. So we're going to look at short again on the solutions on that also for the ones who weren't joining here on Tuesday. And this is the Siemens medium voltage breaker, which is in the metal clad uh, switch gear. We have outdoor breakers. And a thing I want to mention here is that you see that they work safe here. You can actually see here to the left that they have grounded, not only on this side, but on this side as well. And the circuit breaker is actually closed here. So you have a safe situation to connect. But they're actually preparing here for normal timing, uh, classic timing with one side grounded. So they're going to remove one ground before they start measuring. And then this is this ABB breaker in Mosambik. Uh, we come up to the bigger breakers. Uh, here is outdoor breakers, uh, a live tank to the left and a dead tank to the right. Dead tank, American type of circuit breakers, lower uh, point of weight, so it's more stable the, than the pole types to the left. And here we have a new picture, right? This is uh, two brakes per phase to the left, and actually a four brake points per phase to the right. And the picture to the right is a Siemens, and uh, we actually show only show two phases in this picture. It's taken up from the third phase. And uh, the solution here is actually that it's 400 kV circuit breakers, and they put two in series to obtain the 800 kV. So this is a special, really special solution. Uh, what you can see on these pictures also is that you have parallel circuits over the poles here. Uh, 
a grading capacitance, and here you have both grading capacitance and peer pre insert and resistant contacts, which are often used on higher voltages. It's a cheap, cheaper solution than to use synchronized switching, which is a more modern way to solve the problem that you need the voltage distributed, distributed over the whole four break points of the phase. Sorry, the graining capacitance is that. The PS is to limit the current during the closing. I said the wrong word here. So here you can see uh, a close up on this uh, same breaker, uh, the uh, 800 kV. And you can see here the peer, which needs a mechanism, right, to be able to operate. The grading capacitances, which is here, is directly fixed, connected without any mechanism because it's it's connected there the whole time. And you have the main contact in the middle. And we also on high voltage have GIS, gas insulated switchgears. And here you have an example of that. As you can see, you have a metal um, cover over the whole switchgear, and it's even hard to realize where the actual breaker is situated. But we get some help here so we can have open up the covers so you can see the circuit break in the middle. And you can also see here that it's three faces in the same compartment. But it can also be separate compartments, certainly for higher voltages. And this specific one is an ABB, or as it's called now, Hitachi a circuit breaker or switchgear, an ELK. And this picture you can also see a little bit showing the mechanism. Up here you have a mechanism on this circuit breaker. They put a mirror here so we can peek in a little bit into the circuit breaker. Parts, yeah, we are going to focus a little bit more today here on the SF6 circuit breakers. And here we have a SF6 breaker uh, with the different parts. You have a nozzle here, the gray part, and inside is the arcing contact. The nozzle here is to protect the main contact, which is outside the nozzle, because the arcing is performed inside between the two arcing contacts. Yeah, the pre insertion contact I, I talked about earlier. We want to limit the current here and transi transition voltage when we do closing. And this, this circuit is connected the whole time when the circuit breaker is closed. So I heard somebody mention one there, but you have resistance in circuit that will limit the current when it's closed as well. No, if you think about it, you have two parallel paths. So by having this one in parallel, you will actually have less resistance in the circuit. So we don't disconnect this after connection, this. It is, will be a parallel path for the circuit breakers current. Interrupters, yeah, here we have a, a part where we can see inside. You see the nozzle here, a little bit bluish, and the main contacts upper and lower, and the arcing contact. So the difference here is the arcing contact, it, and I'm sorry, the SF6 circuit breaker, it really goes into position, while here, where we have a vacuum breaker, it's two plates that meet. So they are totally different in the way they behave and work. In the SF6 gas, in the SSX circuit breakers, you have a gas which will get compressed during the, the um, operation and it will be used to quench the arcing when it's opening. Also, there will be a temperature raise if there is arcing, which will also make a higher pressure in the gas, which will quench even more. So it's a quite clever solution. But SF6 is a trouble, right? It's very bad for the environment. And uh, that's why we today try to work with higher voltages also on the vacuum breaker. So Siemens has one for 145, and I have heard that in Asia 
they even have higher voltages of vacuum circuit breakers. I haven't seen them at all, but this kind of development, of course, they are chasing each other, the different manufacturers. On outdoor breakers, they also try to use other gases. So we have CO2 up to 72 kV. And we also have a, a, a gas here, as you see to the left, right, sorry. It's G3, which is a mixed gas. And I want to mention, as I also mentioned on Tuesday, that it is important to realize that the circuit breakers are not only the contacts. The manufacturer, of course, they think that the, the gas and the sparking contacts and contacts are really important. And of course they are. But actually, when you look at numbers of poles, operating mechanism is actually the main problem. But of course, it's also a matter of different um, severity of problem. But between 70 and 80 percent of the faults are actually in the mechanism, and as low as 9, 10 percent are in the interrupters. So it's important to not only measure the contacts; it's important to have a control over the whole um, circuit breaker. Basic test on the higher voltages um, has. Um, SF6 circuit breakers creates a little bit different demands. Of course, we measure contact resistance measurement, we measure timing, we measure auxiliary contacts, coil current, and when we measure coil current, if we measure first trip, we we're going to talk about later, it's a really, really important uh, measurement. Minimum voltage test, of course, needs to be done, motion, spring motor, current, but specific test is things like dynamic resistance. On SF6, it's really important to be at the top of the, uh, um, the status of the arcing contact, because if it gets burned down too hard, it will not be able to operate in the right way. And again, I mentioned contact resistance measurement, at least 50 amps, and American standards actually say 100. But also, both side grounded is here much more important when you more work outside. But the G GIS, you really have to consider some, some things when you measure because you have a very low resistance in the ground. If you do dual ground with outdoor circuit breakers, it's important to, to um, be aware that it's good to compensate for the current. It, it, Depending on the resistance, it can, of course, be possible to measure contact resistance, resistance measurement with two sides grounded without compensating. But you must be aware what you're doing here. You have to know that then you, you miss the component of the current flowing through ground. And this example, you will get a 10% fault. But this, of course, it's a matter of the knowledge you have, how experienced you are, if you can consider to, to not calculate on that. We're using uh, the Mjolnir here in this picture. We compensate automatically by using a clamp in the ground. But when you measure on GIS, then the resistance is ground is really, really low. And it's always also very different to access. You can't connect directly at the bre uh, breaker's contacts. You normally need to connect far away from the breaker and maybe at ground. And you have also a problems where you really want dual ground because you have a lot of induction, capacitive coupling from closed live top parts because it's much more tight and narrow. That's the whole point of when they start making the GIS. They had lack of space. They wanted to make the different parts in the stations closer together. So it's this GIS, they are popular in cities, in, in, in um, harbors, um, airports, and of course on places, other places where you, the ground is very either narrow or expensive. 
if you have to think about it, you make a big station and all of a sudden you need to, the city has become bigger and you need space, but all of a sudden there is city all around the station. So then you can't even, even expand, even if you wanted to. Um, but when you do resistive measurements, the resistance will get, get relatively high because you're not only measuring the actual break point, you will measure also the bars and the, the uh, different components between your connection point and the circuit breaker and on both sides, right? And as I said, resistance in ground is low, so that makes it even more trouble. The whole enclosure is part of the ground, that's what makes the trouble. So in this case, you must compensate. And how? Yeah, you use the current plant. And here you have in the picture an example of that, where we needed to use two clamps. And it's just prepared, as you see, they're not connected yet, but they put in position to, to at the uh, grounding bar. And it has two parts for ground here, so we needed two current clamps. And I wanted to show you here an example. Here you have a circuit breaker up in the middle, you have a current transformer, and you have a bus bar at the top. And here it's all enclosed in the big enclosure, so you can't access here. You have the grounding points here and here, and you have the isolated grounding point here. And if you measure this um, circuit breaker once I ground it or with dual ground and compensate, you will have 150 micro ohms. From this point to this point. The problem is if you don't compensate, you will have a resistance also in the ground. And the earthing link and housing is as, as low as 75 microns. So it's even less than the, res the resistance you want to measure. And if you will measure this in the wrong way, you will get 50 microns. Connect the current, but they will go both ways, right? And the result will be 40, 50 microohms. Because as you see here, you have the, the micrometer and you have a circuit breaker loop, but in parallel, you have an earth loop. So you inject and you want to inject 100 amps to follow the American standard there you need to inject 300 amps, or if you want to fill out IEC, you will need to inject 150 amps. 300 amps will go from your instrument, but only 100 will go through the loop, and 200 through the earthing loop. So to get the correct result here, you need to remove the current from ground. So you, used to, you need to use current clamps. And in this case, there are two parts. And you can measure the correct value. But again, you don't only measure the circuit, it's the circuit breaker circuit. It's not only the circuit breaker here. It's all these bars. And as soon as you have an, another component like this and this, and also, of course, the bars itself and the intersections here, you will get resistances. So you, this is the total resistance from here to here. Uh, to do this, uh, you can work either with a Mjolnir, and of course, if you, you need as much as 300 amps, you need the big Mjolnir 600. And otherwise, you can work with Mjolnir 200 or the SDRM, which are both 200 amps. Measuring timing, yeah, now we're outside and of course it's a different situation and they really recommend to work with two sides grounded, with dual ground. Um, it is connections directly at the faces and yes, you do ground on both sides. 
before you do any connections. But of course, the cables are connected up to these parts, disconnected parts, but influenced by nearby uh, lines and bays and overhead lines. So it's and it's really wise to work with two sides grounded here. So, but we do have open, yeah, we have opened the circuit. But when you have a parallel line, it works like a condensate, a capacitance between the parts of a line which you have still in, in your circuit breaker circuit. And you will get an induced current down to the test equipment. When the breaker is closed, it will go this way. But as soon as you open the breaker, which you do during testing, this side's induced current capacitive coupling will go through instrument. But with two sounds grounded, you will have a path and safe environment where you work the whole time. Well, dual ground concept then. How does it work? Yeah, when we do normal classic timing, we work with a low voltage DC, voltage DC to to measure whether the circuit breaker is closed or not. But when we do dual ground, we actually work with a frequency instead. So we we do a resonance frequency here. So we lock the current at a certain level, and we when the circuit breaker changes position, the frequency will change and the current will change. Here you see how simple this is to connect. You see we do have another type of cable with a little box which we connect directly at the pole. And if you look really close, you can see the groundings here. I want to, the special thing to do here is that you need to tune and you need to ground properly. If you are using separate grounds, this will work perfectly. If you have working with grounds which are one common ground point, then it will be more complicated. But with normal ground leads on each face, this will work as simple as a normal one side grounded. But you keep the ground during the whole work. And of course, it doesn't even only get safe, it also gets more efficient because you don't have to remove grounds and ask for permission and so on. So it's efficient way to work. But we made this to be able to work safe. But in a while, we started to notice this have another function. That is to use this when we have GIS because we have sometimes difficult configurations. In this case, we have a circuit breaker here, which is directly connected out via slacks to a long line, 20 kilometer line, and no possibilities here to disconnect and ground. Of course, ground you can do, but you can't disconnect. And here on this side, you have a grounding, right? And you can't remove this grounding when you do the timing. But with dual ground, we can connect and measure via this ground, this circuit breaker. Also, another GIS here, where you have a transformer which is directly connected on the right side here. To measure this in classical way, you would have to remove the slack here on the transformer and that's always a risk to do that, of course, not to get it properly placed again. And it's not always so easy. It can be quite a lot of screws and details. But with dual ground, we can measure this without removing any mounted parts. So how is it done? You know, we access often the other ground points. Uh, you have a Siemens circuit breaker here, and I think that was a Siemens as well, this one, right? Uh, and here you see the timing leads connected, and the timing leads also here connected directly at the grounding point. 
And in both these situations, you see ferrites named in here. I'm going to come back to that. Another common point on uh, ABB switchgear is this ground point here, which is up here. You have to take off the cover here. So this is not gas compartment. This is just like a hat, right? So this is how it looks like. And here we have mounted the timing cables and uh, with ferrites. So another configuration where you have the disconnector here, which can be closed here, but you need to remove a slack to be able to measure the traditional way. But with dual ground, you can keep the connections and actually connect at the transformer or the slack and at the ground. And the circuit you the instrument will find will be here via the ground through the closed earthing switch, measure the circuit breaker and through the closed disconnector. And you will keep the safe ground on both sides, both here and here during the whole measurement. And no changes in the mounted details on the switch gear. Here is where we measured on a circuit breaker, which were which had this uh, big bushings through the um, through the um, wall, and we measure at one side, which is grounded, and to the ground in the mechanism here. Or sorry, in the structure here. And here we measure directly at the transformer. We connect up here at the transformer flag and on the groundings. So it feels a bit magical to stand outside and measure the breaker, but as you see again, you get the circuit in up from the slacks or the flags through, meet the circuit breaker, and through the ground you will meet and find the circuit. To do this, uh, you either need a team 1700 or a team 1800, either team 1700 here with a box or team 1800, it has a built in module. You can see it's here, but it's hard to see, but it's, it's built in. And you work with this special cable. And for some solutions like this ABB, you need to work with ferrites to be able to connect directly at this earthing point. Sometimes it's too narrow, uh, then you can use own made big grounding and replace them. But of course, then you have to check if that's okay with the manufacturers. And of course, you need to use thick connectors here. The ferrite kit which you use uh, has both C ferrites and straight ferrites and round ferrites. So in this case, I think there is one C and one flat. So one C and one I type, and here you've been using the round ones. DRM, yeah, we, I mentioned that before. That's just a way to shake the SF6 circuit breakers. And also you can do it on oil breakers. But to do it on, an arc, on a vacuum breaker, that's no point because you don't have an arcing contact. And the whole purpose of a measurement is to measure the arcing contact length. In the 90s, when a when, uh, programmer for the, with the, an earlier name of the part of MEGA, where I work, um, introduced this kind of measurements, um, I think it was 95, 96, that before my time, to do this on circuit breakers. The whole technique was actually developed by a guy in Australia, not a, a programmer guy but to use it on circuit breakers, we introduced it in the 90s. And then at that time, we also used it for dual ground, but we found that it was not good enough. So we developed this DCM technique to work safe and also to be able to work on um, dual ground technique on GIS. But DRM, measure the arcing contact length to know without mounting apart the whole circuit breaker, how long 
life length you have left of the atom content. How do you do it? Yeah, it's a little bit like the static resistance measurement, almost like contact resistance measurement, but you're doing during an operation. So you measure voltage, current, and calculate resistance and measure motion at the same time. I know there are some who even are so cool, so they don't measure motion and say, oh, I can evaluate this with just measuring voltage and current. But as soon as you got the chains, the, the motion is really useful here. You get really valuable information. To do this, you use uh, Team 1700 or Team 1800, and it can actually also be done the Eagle. But the best solution, I would say, is to work with the big instruments here. You need analog channels for motion and current. And with uh, Team 1700 and 1800, we're using the timing channels to measure voltage. So we already have those circuit, uh, circuit connected at the breaker, and you can connect this DRM set before you do the timing. So you can do all the connections at the pole directly. So here is a detail of the inside of these details you want to evaluate. We have a moving contact here, down here, you see it in other angles, so you can see the arcing part and the main part. And here is the main part, and the arcing part is sticking out here. So you want to make sure this is sticking out enough, so it will really take the arcing. You see the upper point here in another angle, and you can see that it has springs and different fingers. And this you also can evaluate a little bit on the graph you get from the DRM measurement. The white here is the nozzle, and that is used for controlling the gas, but also for protecting the main contact from the arcing. So the, the, the um, separation the arcing is done inside here. If you open up an old breaker, this Nozzle will not look like this. It will be much more worn out. This is like a really new condition. You can also see on the contacts that it's really nice and clean and no worn contacts. So what's happening? What is it we want to see and how does it work? Yeah, the current goes through the main contacts over to the, the moving contact, sorry, and through the arcing contact in the middle. And here you also see the nozzle, the blue grayish part here. The circuit brakes start the operation, doing an open operation, and the main part has separated here. So all the current is now flowing through the arcing contact. And now the whole circuit breaker has released mechanically, but the current is still flowing because you have the arcing going on between the arcing contacts. And the gas will now also help to blow out the arc in this closed compartment. And finally, it will get extinguished. This is the graph you will get. A quite nice clean graph to evaluate and if you don't haven't seen this before okay i will start first with just mentioning which graphs it is and also what is really easy to evaluate you have a motion it's an open operation so it starts here and it goes from closed position to open position and static down here and you have a resistance which will increase, decrease even more, making like a stack. And then it goes to total maximum of the measurement channel, actually, because the channel has a maximum here. But of course, this is max, max, max resistance. This is open, right? And here you have a current, more or less static, and then it's dropping to zero. So what you can see here with not so much knowledge is that the circuit breaker is opening here because here the resistance goes to total supermax 
and here the current is interrupted. What's happening here? Yeah, here the circuit breaker is static. Nothing is changing, right? Here it starts to move, and then you will get a sliding of the main contact. So this part tells us information about the arcing contact, sorry, about the main contact status. And here you get the information of the last part, which is the arcing contact. So in here you have the arcing contact, the main contact in parallel, while here only the arcing contact is in, in, in the circuit. So you have movement start, you have a travel curve, you have a resistance changing, going up to a step, and then total release. So the current will go to a, a zero. So what you want to look at is mainly the distance between this and this, and that you can read out from this motion graph, because this is here in the same time and graph. So if you get changes here, this is mainly because of things like springs on the main contact, uh, the pressure, and maybe dirt on the contact. Well, if this one is changing, that's a matter of that the arcing contact has changed. And the biggest trouble is when this is starting to get shorter. So the break all of a sudden open earlier and you see that this is getting closer and closer to where the main contact is in the circuit. Here we have put two graphs at the top of each other. It is the yellow as new and the pink after a really tough breaks. So here, this graph has all of a sudden changed much earlier. And this is how it looked like. This is the arcing contact in, in well overused shape, I would say. And this is how it looks like when it's new. Here you have the fixed arcing contact, the new and the old. And here you see a detail of the same. So it's, you can really see when you open up a breaker. But of course, to open up a breaker is a heavy work, which you don't want to do if you don't have to. So to measure this DRM, you can detect really inf good information. I talked about the resistance earlier in the circuit, uh, that it was trouble with GIS because you have a grounding circuit which has a very low resistance and because of that I would still recommend to do DRM with one side grounded and I hope we're going to be able to help and do a better solution for that but it is difficult to, to do GIS dual ground on DRM. Our solution with DRM is that we use an injector which we hang directly up on the pole. So we try to keep the injector as close to the pole as possible. And here it's uh, placed at the pole and we're only using one of the channels. And it's a very light unit, so it's easy to work with it. And you also can have much shorter cables because you place it close. close. So you don't have to carry eight kilos of one single cable, just because you want to inject high current at the pole. And this is used with uh, ultra capacitances, so it's a really clever little unit. Um, we have been talking about these classical measurements and also now this DRM, but we also promised to mention ways to measure the circuit breaker without having connections directly at the faces. Yeah, we have one measurement type, which is called first trip, uh, which is made with normal circuit breaker analyzers, but you need some accessories. But you have to be really cautious here. The circuit breaker is live. You need to have a power in the station to be able to measure the first trip. You do the measurement without connections at the faces, so you don't have to access those. 
and you measure coil current measurement. That's really important during this measurement. And the, the specific thing here is that you measure the first operation after a long period of rest. If the circuit breaker has been static for a year, as you know, with different breezes and there could even be a, like a bird nest or something in the middle of it. But the first operation we do, we not, normally don't check. We make uh, open to be able to disconnect and ground to do the measurements. But here we can measure that first one. So we really know the, sh the status of the circuit breaker before we got to the station. And you, of course, do comparisons a lot here as well. You want to compare with standard uh, timing in cold trays. What should we consider here? Yeah, as I said, the circuit breaker is live, be aware of that. And to work safe, I would recommend to delay the start of operation so that you can move out of the way. You can stand 100 meters away, just put a delay and you can walk out of there. So first trip reveals real condition, real world. What's the status of the breaker before you start any um, breeze, any operations? It's as when you come there. And it's quite a simple and fast hookup, so it's quite efficient. Um, and you will have no operation which is not controlled during the measurements. And you don't even have to take the breaker out of service. So it's a quick way to get a feel of the health of the circuit breaker. It don't test everything. You want your DRM, you want to contact resistance measurement. But you will get a quick way of a mini condition, I would say, mini condition test. So, but the good thing, you catch this first operation and there are different situations. Sometimes you have a parallel path, sometimes you don't. And if you have a, haven't have got um, a parallel path, you will do open close, multiple operation with a delay in between. And this short outage is normally not considered as an interruption of power supply to the delivery to, to uh, the network. And by this, you will, of course, get a very short interruption, but you can't measure the timing in, in a good way. Normally, you can measure, say, first trip, you measure in the CTs, but when you don't have a parallel path, this is not um, so interesting information. But if you have a parallel path, you can uh, make a real slow open, normal open and and short after do a close again. But then you have an interruption in that specific bay, right? And then you can measure also the time measurement in the CTs. So you're going to measure whether there is an AC or not. But you will get opening time, not trip time. So you have to be aware of that when you compare the results of that and analyze. So what do you do? Yeah, you connect uh, current transformers in the secondary circuit of a current transformer, uh, preferably the protection CTs, and you connect a current clamp in the control circuit. Here we have a common mechanism. We also measure the voltage here in the circuit. And often it is like this. You can't control it from the instrument. You need to control it from the um, from a station's control, but then you still can catch the current by using a current clamp. Here you can see that it can be a bit tricky here, even just to get them connected. It's uh, the cubicle, it may be good, big enough, but the terminals here are quite small, so it gets quite narrow. It's a nice built cubicle, but a bit narrow for our test, testing work to be done. So we have free currents for the um, uh, controls and free current clamps for the CTs. Here we have an example. We look at the peak current here. We look at the control voltage here. And we calculate the resistance of the circuit. We look at armature start current, the stop time, and we 
look at main contact timing with the CT. We look at that we have a sinus and it gets interrupted here at around 30 milliseconds. So we get an indication of the trip time, get an opening time. Here we have a case where we only look at the current, the current in the control circuit, and still we have interesting information. You can see that they are different in, in the operation type because you have different uh, armature time here. And the, the delay is 0.3 faster during the second time we operate the circuit breaker. And he did it a third time, and it was 0.66 milliseconds faster. So you directly can see that this is things that are influenced by the single operations. The operations makes the circuit breaker quicker. So there were no service in between with just the operation that has trained the circuit breaker to become faster because the different links has been operating towards each other and works smoother. So we detected that the circuit breaker was not in such a good case, shape. This is the equipment you use, an analyzer, either uh, Team 1800 or Team 1700, and a first trip kit, which is current clamps. And I mentioned this on Tuesday, but I don't know if everybody was attending then, that you can also measure difficult circuits with um, medium voltage by measuring the um, online measurement without connecting at the basis. And that's possible when we have this type of outlets, VDS outlets. We have another type here and a third type here. You work with this little box, you see it here in use, and the analyzer, either team 1700 or 1800. You get here an opening and you see an interruption and you get it also in a parameter list. So we get it like listed results. But again, when you do this kind of measurements, I recommend to delay the operation and take a step maybe into the other room or uh, on the other side of the transformer or something move away from the circuit breaker because this is live operations, live changes, uh, live changes in the circuit breaker. So to work, work with outdoor breakers, uh, I would really recommend the Team 1700 or Team 1800. And depending on how many breaks per phase, you will need to, to use Team 1800. If it has three, four break per phase, then it's a Team 1800. Also, if you want a module system to build out with more channels in the future, also Team 800 is a, a, a more uh, flexible choice. For low voltages, I would say maybe up to 200 kV. It can be possible also with Eagle, but remember here you can only control one mechanism. Um, Sorry, you can only measure one mechanism. You can actually control the two, three, the common one, uh, not only the common one, but separate ones, but you can only measure one coil current here. And you have a limitation of only one analog channel. That's the limitation of EGIL. Okay, we are going to have a small session here for Mary. Mary, can you take over with the questions and answering? Hi, Lord. Thank you very much for this first part of the webinar. Um, before going to the demonstration, we have a question. So the question is, why are arcing contacts not in vacuum circuit breakers? What is the effect of grading capacitors and ECR to contact resistance? The, the grading capacitors is uh doesn't influence the DRM and they are not on vacuum breakers normally because you don't have vacuum breakers normally with more than one break per phase. And the whole idea of the graving capacitance is, is that you are going to um, set, um, get this voltage evened over the breaking points. 
So if a grain capacity is too even that you have, if you have a 400 breaks, a phase circuit break with four break points, you want, um, so 400, you want 100 volt, 100 kV over each part. You don't want one break point to do all the separation, all the breaking. So you even out the voltage over the four break points. And that is normally SF6 circuit breakers. Uh, do Mary have? Do we have a say, right screen now? Are you showing the pictures? Because I I don't, um, I don't maybe I don't see the right thing here. Uh, no, not for the moment. We are going to uh, to see the video demonstration now. Uh, so okay. if you want to introduce it, as we don't have any question for the moment, but maybe okay. we will have more questions after the the demonstration. This demonstration, this video, uh, this film uh, with uh, demonstration is a team 1700, can also of course be done with an eagle, we did that on Tuesday. And um, I want to mention that this is in a controlled room, right, we don't have any overhead lines or anything, and the circuit breaker is taken out of its cubicle, so we don't work with groundings and stuff. So if you work, you, of course you need to follow your local safety the instructions and work safe, right? And also when we do mounting of transducers, I want you to consider that the springs must be uncharged so you don't damage your fingers because that can be quite dangerous, right? So okay, let's watch the video. Hi and welcome. My name is Bo Ekberg. I'm the application specialist of a mega factory in Sweden. Today we're going to measure a medium voltage breaker with use of our big analyzer, TIM1700, and we're going to use a B10E to supply the circuit breaker during the operation. We are going to control the object from the control module. We're going to measure timing and we are going to measure motion. So we're going to use the control channel, which uh, sends out control close and control open. And if you have an open two, you can also use a third channel for open two. We are going to use these two. It's measuring coil current at the same time and also automatically the auxiliary contacts in the circuit. We are going to measure timing, as I mentioned, with the timing channel. We're only going to use the three channels this instrument has six, and we're going to measure analog motion, and we're going to use the analog channel, which is flexible also for other analog measurements. And this instrument has six channels, but we're only going to use one. We're going to measure on the circuit breaker such a, it's a 12 kV medium voltage breaker. It has three phases, the upper and the lower contacts, it has a motor mechanism, a common mechanism for all three phases. I start with the connections. I'm going to connect the power supply to the motor, the plus and minus on B10E, plus and minus on the object. I continue with connecting the supply for the coil, the plus, and the minus. The plus goes to the instrument, to the control, and the minus goes to the object, the circuit breaker, the minus. To get the supply to all channels we use, in this case we're going to use two channels, I'm going to use these links. I'm going to connect a plus link 
I will not use the third one. And a link for the minus. And again, I'm not going to use the third one. I'm going to continue connecting the connections for the control of a circuit breaker. I have the close. and the open on the instrument. And I also need to connect the minus because I want the minus on the, in the circuit breaker to meet the poles. I connect close on the circuit breaker And open on the circuit breaker. And I also connect the minus. I continue with the, the timing channels. I connect up the instrument. Phase one. Phase one on the object. Upper contact and lower contact on phase one. I continue with phase two on the instrument. Upper contact, lower contact, phase two. I need to move the cables so they are not in the way for the moving parts. And last, phase three on the instrument. Upper contact. Lower contact on phase three. And let's go over to the mounting of the transducer. To do this, I have prepared uh, the different parts from the ready-to-use mounting kit. The clamp, the arm, the white holder, and the transducer. I need to mount the details together. Steady. I go over to mounting the transducer in the white holder. And the flex coupler at the axis. This must have a distance in between here. And the cable is connected on the other side. And now we're ready to mount it on the circuit breaker. I have connected a part from the rotary kit on a rotating point in the mechanism. This rotating point reflects the motion of the pole. I have prepared the angle so I can easily connect the transducer. I need to connect it steady with a C-clamp and adjust the angle so it's aligned and properly and steady and I have to connect 
and adjust the flex coupler. I need to extend the transducer analog cable and connect it to the first analog channel. There is one more thing we need to do. We need to charge the motor. I put it to motor. And charge the motor. I need to turn it off and put it to coils again. And I need to link so we have a continuous plus. So this needs to be linked. I need to do my setup in Carbawin in the PC. When you work with Team 1700 and Team 1800, you do the settings in the test plan editor. So you create a new setup from the test plan editor. I create a new breaker, give it a name, I have one interrupter per phase, one mechanism, I want to measure auxiliary contacts, and I want to measure contact travel. I'm going to use relative, and I'm going to use 100 as nominal stroke, and it's one common motion. I want to have a pre trig measurement time, so I set this one to 100, and I continue and create my menu. I want to close operation, and I want to measure motion, voltage, and current and my auxiliary contacts. And I'm going to use the control circuit to measure it. So it's in the coil circuit. I do similar for open. And auxiliary contacts. And I continue and also prepare for a close open operation. This operation I'm not going to do today, but this is a normal setup. Here I don't want to measure my auxiliary contacts during the multiple operation. But that, now I have prepared my breaker and I can leave the test plan edit. to continue and here I have my breaker in the list I start with creating a new test and select close for the first operation I do a new recording and I need to confirm the motion by clicking on the flashing C for the analog channel. I'm going to do the control operation. To do the operation, you see you get a message there that you need to press control. So I press control and operate measure button. And now I'm going to get a bang. I got the result on the screen. 
I have my three timings, red, yellow and blue, the auxiliary contacts, light blue and dark blue, the red is the current, it's very small, so I'm going to make that one bigger, and the green is the motion. So I go to layout, and I change the current to 0.1 amps to easily read it. I close and continue. I continue with the open operation. And again, don't forget to press control. And it's going to be a bang. I get the timings, the auxiliary contact timing, the coil current and the motion. We get a timing result of about 55 milliseconds and the current max is 0.5 amps. And we close and finish. Är det så för dig också eller är det klart? Okej. Okay. Mm. So, um, now after this demonstration we have one question, Boon. Yes. Which is, uh, what is the difference between the hop time and the trip time? That's a really good question. And uh, if the circuit breaker is disconnected and you have no uh, current flowing through the main contact, that it's the same thing. But when you do it, when you have current flowing, as you have during first trip and the VDS timing, you will also get the arcing added. So the opening time, it's when it releases, right? But when you talk about, sorry, the trip time is when it opens. But when you have the open, time you also have to have the current out so that's the difference so you add that is an add of time where the arcing is still in process so it gets longer from the, the during the opening i should have i should have had that in the presentation i agree If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to ask, raise your hand, or write it in the in the box. Um, so a second one would be: At what voltage level do the circuit breakers have more than one breakpoint per fire? Oh yeah, that's that's a little bit depending on the manufacturer because they are. And also like the age, if you have older circuit breakers, you have circuit breakers which have like 10 breakpoints, but modern breakers don't have that. But as I showed you earlier, I showed the, the Siemens breaker, which was 800 kV, it had four breakpoints, because you needed that to, to be able to break. But I would say it's around two, modern breakers today, around 200 kV, you can have with like two breakpoints, but when you come up normally to 400 somewhere, there you have 400, uh, two, four breakpoints, but it depends on the type. There are, as the one in the 800 kV, it was a two breakpoints circuit breaker for 400. And I also know that ABB at least used to have a circuit breaker, which can do one break per phase, 400 or 500 kV, but I think they don't even make that one anymore. So this is a matter of the manufacturer, um, and the age and the type of the circuit breaker. And also, we also looked at the, um, the uh, air pressure breaker, which had the disconnector on Tuesday. That one had two or even three breakpoints, even though it was a medium voltage. So it really depends on the type. 
ya. Um, we have another question, which is how often should be done DRM? Oh, yeah. If if you know the circuit breaker has been under hard work, really under pressure and have made a lot of trips, I would really recommend to do DRM. Otherwise, yeah, either when you do your normal testing or maybe every second time or something like that. It depends on the work the, the circuit breaker has done. So it's really hard to make a clear um, answer on that one. So I, I would recommend to do it, certainly if you have older circuit breakers, if you haven't done it before, and you know that they have had a tough job to do because that really burns the contact. And there's also an indication. If a circuit breaker all of a sudden is quicker on, on, um, on um, let's say it's quicker on opening, but slower on closing and in its SFC.